Welcome back, everybody. We are now up to topic 2.4 of the APUSH curriculum that is titled Transatlantic Trade, Transatlantic Trade. So we're looking at the causes and effects with our guiding question. What were those causes and effects of the transatlantic trade? And uh, let's just simply look at the Atlantic Ocean here and take a look at what's all crisscrossing and what's being connected. And as you can see, we've got Europe, Africa, South America, North America all connected. Now, this is better known as the triangular trade route or triangle trade. And I know you're thinking, wait a minute, that's not a triangle. And you're right, it's not. But it is at the same time. So what do I mean by that? Well, the way this would work is Europe, Africa, and the Americas collectively would be those three points. Okay. Or on the flip side, you could think of North America and South America as being two points and then Africa as being another. So it's not that you're connecting all four in one trip. You're connecting three, basically, in one trip. Now, one of those legs uh, we call the Middle Passage uh, was where enslaved Africans and also American Indians uh, were exchanged between Europe, Africa, and the Americas. And Obviously, the topic of African slavery in American history is a very big topic. It's a very important topic, and we've looked at some of the early foundations of it earlier in a, in a previous video. But this is where most of the African slaves came from, and then where most of them are going to go. Now, I want to show you a map that might surprise you. This is something I don't think a lot of Americans know or realize, that when you're thinking about the transatlantic slave trade, um, you're looking about, okay, where did the Africans come from? Well, we know it's West Coast Africa. Where did they go? Well, all, most of them went to the Caribbean and South America, specifically Brazil. This is North America. So what, what will become the topic of American slavery, which we'll spend a lot of time on, it is this smaller arrow, which, again, I think that's surprising for most Americans. Now, the way this works is the European... Um, economies really had a purpose in the sense that they were there to produce the raw materials. They're there to produce stuff uh, that Europeans uh, wanted, whether that's tobacco, whether that's lumber, fish, uh, you know, furs, whatever. Okay, and uh, this was uh, this would then necessitate necessitate the Europeans finding labor sources for all that production of raw materials. So the raw materials heading out from Europe, excuse me, excuse me, from North America to Europe. And you can see that, for example, on our, ma on our map here, things like fish, furs, naval stores. Naval store, it's just a name for um, uh, this, it's like a resin that they collect from trees. Almost like a tar, basically. So here's one of those transatlantic ships, and you can see it's all loaded down with supplies. Um, on its journey across the North Atlantic. Now, when we're looking at industry in the North American colonies, there's not a lot in the sense that they're not manufacturing a lot. In fact, the most important manufacturing that was going on was shipbuilding, because you need so many ships to get across the Atlantic, of course. About a third of all British ships were built in America. Now, this is something um, that it really takes a moment to think about. Think about North America, how many trees there were untouched you know, uh, virgin trees um, that had never been, uh, you know, they've been growing for as many years as you can imagine. Unlike European areas where a lot of forests have been cut down during the Industrial Revolution. So the Europeans were really interested in trees in North America, and the best trees were saved for the king, for the Royal Navy. And they would put this little mark, looks like an arrow, on those trees to let you know, don't touch that tree. That's a king's tree. Now, how does this transatlantic trade affect Native Americans? Well, in some cases, they were enslaved and shipped to uh, the British West Indies to grow cash crops. But the ones who are not, who stayed in North America, this is going to increase the flow of goods in and out of their communities. It's going to lead to a lot of changes in the uh, Native American economy. Uh, they're going to become, um, I won't say capitalists, but certainly um, the idea of moving away from barter and moving, moving towards some sort of commodity-based um, uh, exchange of, uh, of goods, that's something that's going to you know, lead to a lot of... Um, new ways of doing business with the Native Americans. It's also going to lead some problems. Uh, some of those goods that were coming into the Native American villages would be firearms and also alcohol, and that's a dangerous combination. 
And the most disturbing part of this is with trade comes exposure to disease. So Native Americans, again, we looked at this earlier with the Columbia Exchange. Uh, they are very, very susceptible to European diseases. All right, one of the big topics we're going to cover in this, in this um, section and one that you're going to have to apply several more times um, this semester is something called mercantilism. Mercantilism. What the heck is mercantilism? Well, it, it's, it's, it's kind of complicated, but I'm trying to make it as simple as possible. And the way we're going to do this is by looking at this uh, graphic organizer. You can see there's a lot of words missing. Okay, what goes here? So think about power. What equals power? The answer is wealth. Wealth equals power. Well, how did you measure wealth back then? You measured it in physical wealth. And then since that, you know, physical money, gold and silver, how much of that stuff you have? Well, how do you get gold and silver? How do you build up your gold and silver supply? Well, you have to export more than you import. In other words, you have to sell more than you buy to run a profit in gold and silver. And that's how you earn your power. Well, how do you do that? Well, you need something to provide raw materials and also a market for the goods you're making out of those raw materials. What would that something be? That something would be colonies. So mercantilism is all about Europeans establishing colonies overseas that serve as a, a raw material um, bank, basically, they can draw on, and then also a group of people who will buy the stuff that you are making out of those raw materials. That is mercantilism in a nutshell. So to pursue mercantilist policies, the British and other European countries did this as well, but we're focused on the British right now. They instituted a series of laws known as the Navigation Acts. This is back in 1650, so very early on, what, uh, I guess, 43 years after the settlement of Jamestown. These laws did, uh, among other things, require that English uh, colonial goods had to be shipped through English ports. So if I lived in, say, Virginia and I was selling tobacco, that tobacco would have to go from, uh, from Virginia to an English port, say Liverpool or some other city. That stuff also had to be carried on English ships, and those ships had to be manned primarily by English sa uh, sailors. Now, English, from our perspective, is also Americans at the time, right? We were English people, so uh, people living in Virginia would qualify as as one of those English references in the Navigation Acts. But the point is, what this does is it very much puts limits on who you can do business with and how you can do business. So let's look at some, at some advantages and disadvantages of the Navigation Acts. On the plus side, what this does is it really provides a major uh, incentive for New Englanders to build ships. And so the shipbuilding industry in New England uh, grows. It also grows in the middle colonies as well, places like uh, Pennsylvania. And so uh, that, that is because, of course, those English goods had to be transported on English ships, so you got to build the ships. This also gives the Chesapeake colonies, like Jamestown and the surrounding areas, um, a monopoly on tobacco in England. So you pretty much have a guaranteed market for your tobacco if you were an American colonist. Someone's going to buy your tobacco in England. That's, that's good. You've got to sell your tobacco to survive. Sounds pretty good so far. What are the downsides? Well, the major downside is not only could you only sell to the English, you could only buy from the English. So if the English were selling a product um, for a much higher uh, price than a, say, a French seller or a Dutch seller, you had no choice but to legally buy it from the English. To buy it from the French guy would be smuggling, and that is a crime. So you were locked into English prices, and they set them, um, and you didn't have a lot of impact, input into that, that setting of price. The Americans also didn't like the idea um, of being interfered with by the British. Uh, they don't like the idea of, of keeping their economy kind of just undeveloped uh, because mercantilism does not allow the colonies to build stuff for themselves because if they were building stuff for themselves, they wouldn't buy it from the mother country. So Americans resented, resented that. All right, now the reality of the Navigation Acts, though, is that at least initially for the first Oh, about 100 years or so, navigation acts were only loosely enforced. Uh, we know this as salutary neglect. Uh, 
Okay, salutary means beneficial. You're benefiting from neglect. And what they mean by that is the British colonies, although on the books they had to follow all these rules, in reality they really didn't that much. There was lots and lots of smuggling going on uh, among uh, the colonists, and the British largely looked the other direction. Now, along with that, um, the idea of mercantilism, uh, the British decided that there had to be a, sort of a better way of, of ruling over the colonies. It had to be a more efficient, streamlined process uh, for that. So in 1686, what the English did was establish this thing called the Dominion of New England. And what this was, was basically we're going to take all these colonies uh, up here that had been separate and kind of fuse them together basically as one, like a mega colony. And one of the reasons, uh, one of the major reasons to do this was a to better enforce and administer the Navigation Acts. So, you know, try to cut down on the smuggling things because the British knew they were losing out on money if they weren't actually enforcing the rules. Now, the leader of this dominion was Sir Edmund Andros. And Andros was, was not popular um, with the uh, local colonists, particularly in Boston. He was pretty heavy-handed. He, he shut down a lot of town meetings. He was just frankly kind of a kind of a, a jerk of sorts. Um, but he was in power and he represented the king. And then in 1688 he was overthrown. And the reason he was overthrown is back in England there was also a revolution taking place. And with the king being overthrown, so so was the power that Edmund Andros represented. And so he was basically kicked out of the colony and the dominion was broken up. All right, so we were looking at some causes and effects of the transatlantic trade in this section. Uh, think back to the triangular trade. Think back to mercantilism. Um, those are the big key points you need to take away from this video.